Welcome to week 23 of the Bible Challenge. You're halfway through the entire Bible Challenge. Congratulations. We're continuing in 2 Chronicles this week. And if you recall from last week, 2 Chronicles is a continuation of the longer narrative, 1 and 2 Chronicles. It's written many years after the events depicted in the book itself. Where we pick up at chapter 13 this week is the continuation of the narrative of the kings of Judah without Israel. Israel, the northern kingdom, is now gone. Uh, in chapter 16, the account of the first dynasty concludes. Jeroboam's downfall here in chapter 13 is depicted as resulting from apostasy, from his denial of the reign of the Lord. Uh, Chapters 17 through 25 chronicle a century, a full century of social unrest. The essential struggle is about fidelity to the Lord and is characterized with reference to Elisha's role in bringing about the overthrow of Omri's dynasty. Judah's woes are linked to those of Israel, reflected in the reign of Judah's murderous and usurping queen, Ataliah. The troubles in Judah are also described in a literary fashion for the tale of the Judean king Jehoshaphat's alliance with the Israelite king Ahab reads very much as would a mystery play incorporating an obscure prophet, in this case Eliezer. The balance of the readings this week, beginning at chapter 26, provide the framework for the rise of what we would call book prophecy, that is, writings where prophets are actually recorded not in what they do as in the case of Elijah and Elisha but in what they write down or what is recorded of them writing this will start with Isaiah King Uzziah who is mentioned in chapter 6 of Isaiah as uh, in the sixth year of King Uzziah's reign is when Isaiah the prophet is called King Uzziah here in second chronicles is uh, unusually he has a priestly mentor the priestly mentor being named Zechariah Uzziah's military adventures are recorded only in second chronicles but modern archaeology has tended to confirm the record uh, Uzziah's leprosy is depicted as punishment for his intrusion into the cult of the Lord we can compare this in second Kings chapter 15 verse 5 and in Josephus, Flavius Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews, uh, Book 9, Chapter 10, Section 4, Section 225. Uh, so there's some extra biblical record there. Second Chronicles names the king as Uzziah, as he's named in Isaiah, whereas Second Kings names him as Azariah. It's possible that Azariah was a sort of priest regent acting for Uzziah while Uzziah was debilitated. And then we go on to a depiction of King Jotham. He's depicted in glowing terms, although he is an antagonist of Isaiah. Hezekiah is likewise depicted as an antagonist of the prophet. Uh, in Isaiah 37 and 38 in 2 Kings 20, he's depicted as a weakling. 2 Chronicles 29 to 32 portrays him as a noble reforming leader. So we see some uh, testimonies from different witnesses in the biblical chronicle. Hezekiah's energies are focused on national defense and on ecumenism as a means of alliance. In other words, he's willing to coexist with others and this is contrary to the very strict cult of the Lord and so Second Chronicles views this as a bad thing. Uh, this week in the Psalms we begin at Psalm 125 which is a communal psalm of trust the central theme being the stability of Zion we can compare Psalm 46. Psalm 126 is a communal lament recalling God's past intervention in behalf of his people. The people here pray that this past intervention will serve as a motivation for God's help in the present. There is an interesting phrase here, verse 1, it says, Then were we like those who dream, and the verb root here may also be translated as those who are healed. Then were we like those who are healed. In other words, our dream is realized. Uh, 
we get in verses 6 and 7 a parallel proverb using agricultural imagery to illustrate a reversal of fortune. Psalm 127 is a wisdom psalm which can be compared with 128. The reference here to the house is intentionally one that can apply to the temple as well as to the dwellings of individuals unless the Lord build the house they labor in vain who build it. The emphasis here is on the centrality of the Lord in the life of his people. Psalm 128 is appointed in the Western Monastic Office for the use at Vespers at evening prayer on the Feast of Corpus Christi, the feast which commemorates the uh, physical incarnation of Jesus in his body of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, it's also a wisdom psalm. Psalm 129 is of uncertain classification. Uh, it has thanksgiving elements, but also elements of lament. The use of plowing, plowing upon the back, as a reference to oppression, can be compared in the prophet Micah, chapter 3, verse 12. Psalm 130, a prayer of deliverance from personal trouble. Out of the depths have I called unto thee, O Lord. The depths from which the psalmist calls are the waters of chaos, a theme common in the Old Testament. The word itself, however, is rare, appearing only in four other Old Testament texts, Isaiah 51.10, Ezekiel 27.34, and Psalms, Psalm 69.2 and 14. The prayer is both a direct appeal and a commentary on why the psalmist can appeal to God because the Lord is merciful. The psalmist awaits the Lord's word, that is, his prophetic hope. All of Israel must look to this hope. We finish up Paul's letter to the Romans this week, and it ends in chapter 16 by starting out with sort of a list of recommendations and commendations. This is kind of like being in the American South where you talk about people you know in common. Paul commends Phoebe, a deaconess of the church in Sencrie to the Romans and enjoins that they work with her, that they aid her. She's described as doing the church's work. And then Paul switches to his greetings. And what does the word greet mean here? Well, the word that Paul uses is not the, con uh, it's not controversial, greet or welcome or greet warmly. More unusual here is the form that he uses. He uses the second person plural imperative. In other words, you all greet this person. Normally, the third person singular plural indicative, so-and-so greets you, would be used. So, when the second person plural imperative is greet one another with a holy kiss, as in Colossians 4, 1, 5, we notice the difference. But why is the difference here in these series of greetings? Well, let's look at who's to be greeted. There are 24 individuals named. There are two individuals unnamed. Nine of the people named are women. At least five are Jewish, but probably more. Uh, Prisca and Aquila and Andronicus and Junia and Herodian are probably Jewish, although they don't have Jewish names. There are five groups named. These seem to be house churches. There are no church buildings in Rome at the time. And at least three house churches are referred to, those of Prisca and Aquila, those of uh, Syncritus, uh, and companions, and Philologus and companions, possibly two more, those of Aristobulus and those of Narcissus. Paul is touching all the bases here to say, you and I know the same people, how do we work together? We are in the same mission. Now, what's interesting here is the number of women named. We start out here and we see Phoebe named, and Prisca, Mary, Junia, Trophina and Trophosa, Persis, uh, Julia and his sister, uh, or the sister of Nereus, uh, the mother of Rufus. What's going on here with all these women being named? Well, 
The women are commended by uh, Paul for their hard work. And the Greek word he uses here, koreau, in verse 12, is elsewhere associated with Paul's own missionary labors or those of others. Phoebe is described as a deacon, diakonos, which could mean either helper or servant or could refer to an office in the church. The fact that Paul uh, identifies her as diakonos of the church in Sencrie probably points to that latter meaning of one who holds an office in the church. This is a text that is the subject of much debate now in Roman Catholic circles with the Pope uh, appointing a commission to look into whether or not women can serve as deacons in the Roman Catholic Church. Prisca, which is an affectionate diminutive for Priscilla and Aquila, her husband, are described as having risked their neck for Paul. And we also see them referred to in Acts 18. Priscilla is described as having taught Apollos. Junia is a well-attested female name in Latin. There's not a single reference to Junius, which is the masculine form, in ancient texts. In fact, no ancient translation of the Greek text shows an understanding of Junia to be masculine Junius. We don't really see that until the late 19th century. In fact, in the 5th century, St. John Chrysostom writes in his uh, commentary on the Epistle to the Romans at uh, chapter 31, verse 2, Indeed, how great the wisdom of this woman must have been that she was even deemed worthy of the title of apostle. Andronicus and Junia are almost certainly to be regarded as notable among the apostles. In other words, a limited group of authoritative Christian leaders. So, without further comment, the text bears witness to a woman at the highest level of leadership in the earliest stratum of the Christian movement. What this means for the contested question of women's ordination in some churches is debatable but it is not information that we can just reject. It is information that must be engaged seriously and considered in any debate over the ordination of women, either to the deaconate or to the priesthood or to the bishopric. Now, that's the end of Romans, which takes us into the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. And this letter is really a complex reaction to reports received by Paul about the situation in Corinth. Written by Paul while he's in Ephesus, probably about the year 54. Paul's reacting to a series of problems in Corinth as related to him in the letter, uh, or in letters he has received, and uh, his discussion in his letter back to the Corinthians uh, therefore takes a common form in rhetoric called the peri day form, which means now concerning. In other words, Paul's responding to a series of questions that have been raised by the Corinthians, and he's also reacting to some unofficial reports that he says he's received from Chloe's people of what is happening in Corinth that the other people haven't raised questions about because they don't consider them to be problematical. The reports that he's received from Chloe's people reveal to Paul certain basic flaws in the Corinthians' understanding of Christian community, what it means to be a Christian community. So the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians here are focused on teaching about divisions within the community and what true Christian community is. Chapters 5 and 6 develop the argument into a teaching about the importance of the body. For Paul, the Christian faith is faith lived in community. The individual can never have a relationship with God apart from the body. And faith is how Paul describes right relationship with God, with love being right relationship in community. Love is a necessary expression of faith. Caring for other believers, building them up, warning them are not 
optional things for believers to do. Faith requires us to do these things. So community requires a give and take mutuality. The individual must be prepared to accommodate to the community. That's not a very modern message, but it shows what Paul has been dealing with and what the church has struggled with from the very beginning. Paul never denigrates individual identity of believers. The difference between us is not sacrificed for the community, but is offered for the community. Paul assumes that believers, as individuals, must be responsible moral agents. Life is to be lived in an integration of morals, reasoning, and life in the Spirit, and all life must be lived as a life ready for God's final judgment as a life of gratefulness and thanksgiving, not a life of fear. So to just briefly outline where we are in the chapters that will be covered this week, we start out in chapter one with an introduction, gr greetings and thanksgivings. This continues through a discussion about rival groups in the community. And then Paul sums up that discussion by saying, God has different standards than we do amongst ourselves. He speaks of the power of his own preaching, of true wisdom, and the language of love. He continues in chapter 3 then with the right attitude towards pastors, himself in this case. In chapter 4, the application of metaphors in this argument to the Corinthians. The visit of Timothy, the importance of the body is emphasized in chapters 5 and 6, the community body and so he addresses an issue of a case of incest and how this is a wound within the body clearing up any misunderstanding that may have been based on an earlier letter which has now been lost that's as far as we're going to get in first corinthians this week and we'll see how based on those problems in community paul is now going to start building his argument as the letter goes on about what real life in community looks like what real life in Christ looks like. May God continue to bless you in your study of his holy word. Amen.